Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for inviting me today as an interventional radiologist, which um, may also explain some different perspectives on, on our issues. And this we've seen already. We're moving leftwards on the BCLC scheme to the intermediate stage. And the interesting point um, that we have there, if you look at intermediate stage B, where we're discussing local regional treatments, uh, it's TACE as the only modality that has proven benefit in that status uh, with a multinodular performance status zero. And that's where the challenge start basically because as we all know, BCLCB is extremely heterogeneous and it needs to be discussed what's the best treatment option for an individual patient based on a few factors, which is liver function, which comprises very different, very heterogeneous patients as well as the distribution of tumors in a given patient with uh, no portal vein invasion. However, any size starting at three centimeters, any number of tumors, any distribution. And that might lead to very intense, as we probably all know, very intense discussions inside an institution as to what treatment seems to be appropriate in a given patient. Now, there have been initiatives to propose um, sub-classifications for the BCLCB stage. This year comes from a European group led by, the, uh, by Luigi Bolondi from Bologna. Uh, which suggests a subdivision of B1 to B4 for the BCLCB stage. And basically the difference, and I'll walk you through the most important parts of it, is obviously a liver function with a child Pew score, as well as the size criteria inside up to seven, meaning the number of tumors uh, plus the, uh, the, the diameter of the largest tumor. Uh, so in and outside up to seven, as well as child pew score. If you look at B1, it's five, six, seven points of child pew inside the up to seven rule. If it is B2 and you're leaving the up to seven criteria, um, then you're missing one point, which is important. If we look at the at data I'm going to present to you in a second on the validation of that um, subclassification. So the difference between B2 and B3 is only this one child pew score or, or point uh, which tells us of how much uh, the, uh, the liver decompensation, the liver function will influence outcomes specifically in taste patients. And this is uh, what we have here. It's a clinical appraisal of those uh, proposed subclassifications in a Korean group of patients, 466, as you can see here, and quite interesting outcome. If you look at the stages B1 to B4, it's 41, 22, 14, and 17 months. And the difference between the 22, which is B2, and the 14, which is B3, is that child A versus child B. So something to consider when you're selecting your patients, maybe, as a proposal for, for subclassification. The other things to be considered are other score system being published recently. There is one which is quite interesting, comes from the UK, which is the uh, HUB score, identifying a two to three-fold death risk of taste patients with the albumin decreased or bilirubin uh, increased, the AFP of greater than 400, and the size of the dominant tumor exceeding seven centimeters. Now, in the HUB score, you allocate one point per each of those factors if it is positive. And if you go for a HUB score A, B, C, and D equal to 0, 1, 2, or more than two points, then you will have a median survival in that validation group, the UK uh, group proposed, a median survival of 28, 19, 9, and four months. So the difference of 19 and nine months is HUB B and C, which is one or two out of those four factors, which again gives us, uh, leads us to two uh, very important parts in selecting patients for chemoembolization, which is basically the size of the dominant tumor, as well as the, the underlying liver function. One more, uh, some more data on size criteria and response to a chemoembolization treatment. This is uh, again from uh, Bologna here, some retrospective analysis on the response rate, uh, either in total or specifically for a given nodule after selective, so state of the art chemoembolization. And what you see is that five centimeter is quite of a threshold or kind of a threshold. Uh, if it is up to uh, around five centimeters, it's 63% if it's greater than five centimeters, we're looking at 25% response rate only. And interestingly, the last point here on my slide, um, as an interventional radiologist, I'd always say in former days, well, if I don't catch it the first time, I'll try it the next time and I'll get there at some point in time. But it seems to be that 
the third taste, at least the third taste is without effect if you have a very large tumor. So adding more chemoembolization to a given tumor doesn't seem to have a positive effect. Now this is quite important, looking at the alternatives we have. Um, there is quite emerging data or some, some trials out there being performed or being published, like this one, comparing surgery to taste in BCLCB patients under dispute, under discussion. If you look at surgically performed uh, trials like this one, this is the normal outcome. You will see that the um, the, uh, the advantage for the surgical group is quite extensive as compared to the chemoembolization group. It is worthwhile to analyze a bit more in specific what the inclusion criteria or the patient characteristics are. Basically, if you look at the trial here, um, what's making it more difficult is not the inhomogeneity or the disadvantage for taste with uh, regard to child pew classification or the platelet count indicating the uh, portal hypertension, which is not significant, but it does make a difference. Um, I don't think that the problem is the distribution between those two groups in terms of the distribution of tumor as a single lobe treatment. The difference, or what makes a difference here, is basically its tumor size. 95% of those tumors have very large tumors, which normally are very poor candidates for taste, making this a very good trial to show that if you have a large tumor that you can resect well because liver function is good and you can do it anatomically, then you should do resection uh, specific also in uh, BCLCB stages over a regular chemoembolization. Question is, are there alternatives out there? First of all, decision aid in BCLCB. Chemoembolization is something to consider um, in subclasses B1 and B2 if you consider BCLCB a very heterogeneous class, which I think I've shown up to seven, child pew up to seven. Beyond seven, child pew score should only be six, and there shouldn't be, or there mustn't be, portal vein. Uh, infiltration, ECOG zero is still under dispute. I sometimes find it quite hard to differentiate between ECOG zero and one, but that's out for dispute and for an individual decision, I suppose. There is some more scores out there. I've chosen the HUB score since it seems to, uh, seems to be working quite well also in our patient population. So if it's HUB score A or B, just one or zero out of those four factors, albumin, bilirubin, AFP greater 400 or tumor greater than seven, then you should consider some alternatives. And the question is, what are the alternatives if it is not surgery? There is radiation uh, techniques out there or emerging, data is emerging. We've seen the slide by Josep uh, showing that the data is still scarce, evidence is scarce. This is a, an example of a patient with a very large central tumor, quite dismal localization if you look at taste or surgical options. Now this is a patient that underwent CT-guided brachytherapy, which in some ways similar to uh, stereotaxy, SBRT. Um, the advantage in this case is it expands the limits of the tumor to be treated. So there is virtually no size limit in those tumors. Um, the idea behind it, the concept you, under CT guidance, apply catheters in the tumor volume. You transfer the image data that you acquire after placing those catheters to the treatment planning system. And the system is gonna tell you for how long a source has to sit at the given tumor, uh, sorry, catheter position to deliver your treatment dose. And if you take this patient and some more patients and compare, first of all, the outcome in this specific patient, I apologize, this is 24 months um, with no recurrence in this patient and a full remission, fatal MI, MI at 48 months in this highly selected patient. However, if you take that patient and a few more patients, and perform a randomized trial versus chemoembolization with the endpoint of time to untreatable progression in repeated or uh, single session approaches and secondary endpoints, time to progression and overall survival. The outcome in this exploratory trial with uh, roughly 40 patients in both groups is quite interesting. Patient characteristics are similar in pretreatment AFP, bilirubin, the number of lesions, longest diameter, as well as BCLC or child pew stages. And the outcome in terms of time progression is quite convincing for radiation methods. Again, a pilot, an exploratory trial, uh, showing the uh, potential of radiation techniques also in HCC if it is ablative techniques, 13 versus six months here. 
And if you look specifically at the BCLCB stage, you have survival benefit. I hope you can read that for the brachytherapy with a median survival of 32 versus 18 months if you exclude the crossover patients. So some potential in radiation techniques. And since we're discussing radiation techniques, my next topic is Y90 radioembolization. We're awaiting the results of the prospective randomized trials out there. This year is data comparing um, historical groups, chemoembolization versus radioembolization, quite uh, recent data published in Liver International by an Egyptian with a uh, German group together. And what you can see, what you can learn here, it's uh, again expanding the data on the fact that there seems to be more response in patients undergoing Y90 versus TACE. We all know there is no proven benefit when you have, uh, when you compare these patients. However, response seems to be higher, at least in terms of what you see. There is new data on uh, patients here, again from uh, Bologna, a cohort study with propensity score analysis comparing now Y90 versus sorafenib, 50% BCLCB and 50% BCLCC patients. Again, a propensity score analysis showing no survival difference in the overall group. And this, again, is head to head. What is not head to head is the Zoramic trial. This is the safety data for the combination of radioembolization and Zorafenib versus Zorafenib alone. So first data from uh, the uh, Zoramic trial shows us that the combination is safe. What you can see here is that the, uh, the, the, um, the medication, the drug doses given for Zorafenib in both groups, the experimental group combining Y90 with Zorafenib and Zorafenib alone is identical, basically. Don't go through all the details. There's a list of adverse events. There's absolutely no difference in adverse events between those two groups, either the combination arm or the zorafenib only arm. Data is expected in 2017. So in conclusion, taste patients should be well-selected in large tumors, anatomic resection possible, preserved liver function, surgery should be the option also in BCLCB high conformal radiation techniques, be it SBRT or CT-guided brachytherapy are quite promising, but very preliminary data only available. And the role of Y90 radioembolization is still undetermined. Similar outcomes as the Raffinib and BCLCC, as well as poor Bs with a propensity score matching. But there is somewhat, probably a better patient tolerance towards the Y90 treatment, however, the combination is probably the way to go. The best bet for the future of advanced BCLC B and C might be the combination of Y90 radiomization and systemic therapy. Thank you very much.